Welcome to Menopause Reimagined. I'm your host, Andrea Donsky. I'm a nutritionist for more than 18 years, and I'm in menopause. I'm a menopause educator, menopause researcher, and I'm the co-founder of WeAreMorphous.com, a company that helps to empower you to take control of your health and symptoms in perimenopause and menopause with nutrition, lifestyle, supplements, and research. Today, I'm speaking with Carrie Jones. She's an internationally recognized speaker, consultant, and educator on the topic of women's health and hormones with over 20 years in the industry. Dubbed the Queen of Hormones, Dr. Jones is a naturopathic physician who did her two-year residency focused on women's health and endocrinology. She went on to get her Master of Public Health and was one of the first to become board certified through the American Board of Naturopathic Endocrinology. She was the first medical director of Precision Analytical, the Dutch test, and the first head of medical education at Rupa Health. Currently, she's the chief medical officer at New Ethics Formulations and head of medical education and metabol at Metabolic Mentor University. Now, here's Carrie. Welcome to Menopause Reimagined, Carrie. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to be here and talk about my favorite subject. But this is over the top. Like I, I'm like total girl fan. I totally adore you. Oh. I think you're amazing. I've been following you for a very long time. I know we have a lot of colleagues in, in common. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited when you said yes to coming on our podcast, because when I think of hormones, I think of you. And I'm like super excited to have you here. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. And I will totally take that. I really appreciate you having me on. And I love that we, for the, the listeners, we totally, you know, geeked out, nerded out for about the first 15 minutes. And so I was like, <laughs> oh, we're, we're now best friends. We are now best friends. <laughs> we are. There you go. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's start from the very beginning. So I, I read your bio before we started, but why don't you give a little bit of a background as to what got you so excited and, you know, in, into hormones to talk about hormones? Honestly, so I was born in Michigan, but I was raised in Lexington, Kentucky, of all places. And I was taught health class, sex ed class, whatever you want to call it, by the high school football coach. So you can imagine how that went and what I learned and had no idea about the female body. So fast forward, I was on track to become a conventional doctor. I thought I was going to be an MD and I didn't love what I was doing. I was volunteering in both a pediatric wing of a hospital. And then I was volunteering at more of a like community outreach wing of a different hospital. And I love the community outreach. I love the education. I love the, um, we didn't call it, you know, like root cause or functional or integrative back then, but that's essentially yeah. what they were doing. And I didn't know how to put that into medical practice. And so I moved from um, where I was in college, which is in Ohio, out to the state of Oregon, and I found naturopathic medicine, and I realized, mm. oh, this is what I want to do. And not only that, I found my mentor, who was women's health, hormones all the time, Dr. Kimberly Winstar. And when I realized a lot of hormones I wasn't taught as a woman, and then subsequently, as I saw patients of all ages, all age range, all varieties of life who had absolutely no idea about their hormones, I would have menopausal women who've had four kids, no idea. They're like, I didn't know that's how that worked. I'm like, you, but you've had four kids. They're like, I, I don't know. Like your guess is as good as mine. And I thought, okay, this is what I need to really get into. I really need to get into hormone education because I feel like a lot of the times we go to the doctor, or we have complaints that we would describe as quote unquote hormonal, but we don't quite know what that means. And if we got taught at a young age or we got taught through the decades and we got to understand what's normal versus not normal or common versus not normal. Mm, yeah. And and then had some ideas of how to fix it or address it or what's causing it. Wow, we could just solve a lot of strife yeah. that we go through. And so that kind of became my mission statement as I'm going to educate and empower and have a lot of fun doing it along the way. <laughs> hmm. I love that. And I love that you were, you were saying before that you're 46 and you had mentioned that you were in perimenopause. Tell us a little bit about where you're at in terms of the whole perimenopause menopause phase of life. Yes. Yeah, so I watched my mom go through um, when she was in perimenopause and I mean, mom, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Like it was rough. Like she was having hot flashes constantly, moodiness, weight gain, all the things. And I remember thinking, I don't know what that is, but I don't want to do that. And then in practice in my thirties, all my patients in their forties were like, you just wait, you think you're this, you know, a holistic type doctor and hopefully it'll be better for you. But guess what? You, your sleep is going to change. Your mood is going to change. Your weight is going to shift because of this transition in life. And I thought, I'm going to find a cure for this. You know, like Somehow I'm going to figure this out. And so when I did hit my forties, one of the first things I recognize is, is memory mm -hmm. in that I, I mean, I still have a very sharp memory. 
but I st- will find myself like going to do something. And I'm like, what? Why did I open that tab on my computer? Like, why did I pick up my phone? Why did I, why did I walk into the kitchen? Like, what was the thing I was going to do? And so it really has forced me to like slow down, you know, try not to multitask so much. The sleep comes and goes. Um, I can definitely tell having, I still get a regular cycle at 46 and I still ovulate, let's say most cycles of the year, but not all cycles. And it's not great ovulation, meaning I release the egg, but my progesterone production isn't that great because mm. I live in the world of testing and I test. Yeah. So I know like sleep um, and then more sensitivity to stress. Whereas before I felt pretty resilient. I'm not saying this is healthy, but could burn the candle at both ends and do okay. And now a yeah. um, little more moody, my <laughs> husband would say, a <laughs> little less <laughs> resilient, let's say. And so those are what's happening now at 46, 46. Uh, and I'm watching my, my friends and colleagues who are maybe a little older, like because of menstrual changes, you know, the estrogen is shifting. So now they're getting some of the hot flashes and night sweats, some of the vaginal dryness, some of the joint pain, some of the weight changes. Um, but so that's sort of where I'm, where I'm at right now. And it's, I'm really grateful at 46 to still cycle regularly. I am one of the people, thankfully, who likes her period. I'd like to keep my period. I like to keep those hormones cycling as long as possible. Because you understand it. (laughs) Because I understand it. And I'm also like, it's also a very fat reality check of, I thought I was doing really well before. And I know I need to buckle down and do even better. What's so interesting is uh, I've been in the health and wellness industry for 23 years and I thought, oh yeah, I know my body super well and I'm an educator. That's what I do. I teach people how to listen to their body and to avoid things that can potentially harm our body. And when I turned 47, that's when I got my first hot flash and I had no idea what hit me. I didn't even know the word perimenopause existed. I knew nothing about menopause, nothing about perimenopause. And I thought, wait a second. And I'm in the health and wellness industry. And at this point, I was 17 years in and I'm like- If I don't know, I wonder how many other women don't know either. And I was so right to find out that a lot of us don't. And we do a lot of research at Morphus and we found out about 20%. So we have this amazing survey that we have going over 3,400 people that have filled this out. And about 20% of women have no idea what stage they're in. So it just shows us that we have so much more education that we need to do to explain to women. And because hormones, and even for me, and I've always had hormonal issues. I've had PCOS. Like I've always, I I never had a regular period growing up. And it was one of those things that it was part of that education journey that I just never dove into. So that's why I'm happy. I always say hormones aren't my lane. My lane is nutrition, lifestyle, and supplements. And that's why I love having people like yourself to come on. So let's dive into the hormones. Can you take us back, you know, let's go hormones, menopause, perimenopause, hormones 101. What starts to happen as we go into perimenopause and in menopause so that we can kind of, so we can understand it for those of us who don't understand hormones. And I, I'll tell you what happens most typically. Obviously, there are going to be outliers who are listening to this and this doesn't apply. So in your 30s, in theory, you are having regular menstrual cycles. So picture yourself, picture your hormones on a very controlled roller coaster, right? And your roller coaster goes up, it goes down. Some of your hormones go up, down again. You get your period and you start the roller coaster over again. And it should be very controlled. Every single month, you should know what to expect day to day, internally at least. When you get into perimenopause, which usually starts in the 40 to 45 year old range, obviously it can start later yeah. um, and it can start younger. I have had you know friends who were 38, 39, 36 that are like, I'm starting to notice hormonal changes. And I, I do want you to know if you are in your late thirties experiencing this a lot, just as you said, the nutrition, the diet, the movement, the stress plays a big role in your hormones. Mm-hmm. So let's see if maybe that's the issue first. It's not actually perimenopause. Um, cause I have seen, I have absolutely seen a lot of patients who let's say use the word, clean themselves up, improve all that, those pillars that you talk about. Um, and then they're like, Oh, I feel great again. Like it's not very, like, whew, it's not very menopause, mm-hmm. but it might be. So what happens is your roller coaster starts to go off the track and particularly your communication from your brain to your ovaries around, do you, or don't you ovulate, release the egg. And when you release the egg, that's when you release that magic hormone called progesterone. And progesterone is calming, it's soothing, it's relaxing, it helps you sleep, it helps you have nice, easy periods, it reduces cramps, it reduces clots, all the things. Well, we might ovulate, but we don't have a super strong bat signal anymore, so we just don't pump out the progesterone like, you know, we used to be at 100, now maybe we're at 50. Hmm. And so we don't get that bonus of progesterone, or maybe you just skip ovulation altogether. You just don't, you just stop. 
so now in that early stage, you're like, man, you know, kind of like I was saying, like you kind of notice maybe some mood stuff. You notice some, like your resiliency to stress isn't as great as it used to be. Your periods are getting kind of wonky. And like, like you haven't changed everything yet. Everything is changing. Then as you move along, your brain is still trying to communicate to your ovaries because for some reason in our design, nobody told the brain this is happening. Like, hey, the store is going to be shuttered here soon. We're going to need to wind down. Maybe let's start to disseminate job descriptions to other people, the thyroid, the adrenals. Like, let's recruit right. other help around. Here. Nobody, nobody said that to the brain. The brain's like, where are my ovaries? Why aren't you responding? So as a result, estrogen starts to go haywire, up, down. So now it's on its own roller coaster. It's Sometimes it's really high. Sometimes it's really low. Sometimes it's in between because the brain is screaming at the ovaries and the roller coaster is like, all right, I'll go up. Oh, I'll go down. Oh, I'll go up. And that's how we start to feel. We're like, I just feel like on this hormonal ride, I don't like all the time. Then eventually, as we get into the later phase of perimenopause, our periods may go from regular to shorter they're coming more often to they're coming long, separated long apart, more apart. So now you may go, I haven't had a period in six months. I haven't had a period in four months. Or you may go six months, get a period and get six more months. Eventually the ovaries stop. You, your follicles stop responding. You don't release eggs anymore. The brain's still trying, but you don't do it. And so you go 12 months with no period. When you go 12 months with no period on the 13th month, you're considered menopausal. You can still have symptoms. You can still have hot flashes or night sweats or the weight or the brain fog or the anxiety or the sleep issues. It's the, the do you or don't you have a period that classifies you as menopause. Now, I do want to clarify, it's 12 months of no period at an appropriate age. If someone's listening to this going, well, I'm 25 years old with no period for 12 months, probably something different, not menopause. Let's figure out what that is. Right. But if you're listening to this and you're in your 40s or 50s and you're like, yep, that's me, I'm month 10 girl, two more months, two more months, and you're considered menopausal. But now once you're menopausal, your hormones, your estradiol and your progesterone is, have dropped really, really low. Um, now we call them menopausally low. There is a reference range. They should drop low. It's what they do. But some women drop below even that. They, they just barely eke out any, and boy, do they feel symptomatic. And so you can see we go from a controlled roller coaster to kind of mismatched roller coasters to a flat roller coaster. It, it doesn't, there's no bumps or rides or loops anymore. You just sort of putter along at a low end. Is there, a, you mentioned how we can go for the 10 months without a cycle or without a period and then we get it. Is there any, like, what is the reason behind it? So it's kind of a little bit of a running joke on social media where women were like, yeah, I've gone 11 months and 23 days without a yep. period and there, hello, there you Murphy's. are. <laughs> Murphy's <laughs> law. Yes. Okay. So the, so because the brain is trying to yell at the, at the ovaries, um, they're, you know, where they're called follicles, we have these follicles. And the outer cell of the follicle is called a theca cell. And the theca cell is literally like your outer layer. It's the outer edge of your house that gets all the sunlight exposure, you know, all the things can see it. And so it's the most receptive to brain communication in. So if through 11 months and 23 days, whatever follicles have been sort of around or most uh, available and where the, the brain hormone is coming in, is not responding, not responding, not responding. But if you happen to get a follicle, if you happen to get one that's like going to give it its last hurrah or the brain signal, the bat signal so strong that the follicle goes fine, it will do the thing and it will make hormone and then you will maybe or maybe not ovulate and then you get your period. And so you can get these sort of last hurrah moments because the brain is yelling so much at the follicle, do the thing, make the hormone, have the period that it does. Now, what I do want to warn women of, if you get to 11 months and 23 days and you get it, you start bleeding, um, you just please be sure you may still want to consider, you know, are there other things going on? Maybe it's a fibroid. Maybe it's a polyp. Maybe something like you're taking in that 11 months, you've actually started hormone replacement therapy and you've got what we call your uterine hyperplasia. Maybe you've become hypothyroid. Hypothyroidism can shift our hormones, it can cause some women to have um, in our younger years, heavier periods or change in periods. Like, so just if any, if, if you feel like, ah, this isn't right, there's, I think there's something else going on. Please listen to your gut and get that evaluated. Cause I'd hate for you to get to 11 months and 23 days, start bleeding only to find out it's actually a polyp. Like, oh, we like, let's pluck that out, you know, or we find out, oh goodness, it's actually 
Like now you've developed hypothyroidism because of the change in your estrogen and progesterone. All right, let's get that addressed. So, yeah, and then, if, you know, and then if, you do, if you do get a cycle, then your clock restarts. Your clock clear. restarts. Dark restarts. Yes. Okay. You yes. Know, you, you bring up such a good point, Carrie, and I haven't actually spoken about this. And I, I've alluded to it many times on our TikTok page and, it, you know, in my newsletters, but I actually haven't spoken about it. So to your point, it's so true because when I was 49, I had gone a year I had PCOS my entire life. And so I didn't really get, in, oh, actually in my later years with when I was on progesterone for many years for fertility, I ended up getting my period like clockwork. But as I approached menopause, I didn't have a period. So I got when I for, turned 49, I didn't get a period. And then I got one at 13 months. So yeah. I went to the doctor. I'm like, okay, is this a period? What is it? To this date, I still don't know what it is. In mm -hmm. my mind, my clock restarted. I started again, went again a year without it. Then I bled again, 12 oh. months on the nose. This was spotting. Spotting lasted 12, uh, about two weeks, went to the doctor and I'm like, so what's going on? Like, to your point, I'm like, what's going on? This doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like a regular period. And a lot of women, and I'm bringing it up because a lot of women will ask me on my social media pages, you know, I've spotted within that year. That was the only spot. It was the only blood I saw. Is it, do, does my clock restart? And I do want you to address that. And so I went to the doctor and she was like, we did, you know, we obviously had to do a, a series of tests to find yeah. out what it was. Everything, thank goodness, was okay. And it ended up being vaginal dryness. Oh, and yeah. the vaginal dryness was causing the blood. And so anyway, so I wanted you to just kind of, so I'm so happy you mentioned it because I actually haven't shared that. So for those of you listening, that is my story. So when people will say, Andrew, when did you go into menopause? I'm like, I don't know, 49 <laughs> or 50. I, think, <laughs> I don't know to this date how old I was. So I keep mm -hmm. saying, all right, I was 50. I'll go with the 50 and now I'm 53. I'm like, okay, I've been in it for three years. But I actually really don't know because to your point, because I had that bleeding. At, it was yeah. like 13 months and then at 12 months on the nose. Well, I, so I actually, I have an apprenticeship um, with practitioners and the other day I got an email from somebody in my, in my apprenticeship who said, I have a patient who had some um, like tingy blood in her mucus, her cervical mucus, no period, no cramps, no other symptoms. She's period, like she's gone a while with no period, um, but she's not menopausal yet. Like, do we start over? Does the tingy blood at like one time in the mucus? And I was like, no, that's probably okay. We probably don't have to count that for that reason. It could have been vaginal dryness it could have been rougher intercourse it could have been normal intercourse with vaginal dryness like it could yeah. be like let's keep an eye on it but it, like a little tinge in the mucus i'm not so worried about and vaginal dryness which i don't wish on absolutely anyone oh God, so but if the blood is from oh. that that doesn't count as a start over either because that's coming from the vagina exactly. the canal from the dryness not up inside uh the uterus which is two different things however if it does continue like, right. Like you kept getting it. You can, like always get it evaluated. If you're like, this is 12 months on the dot. This is weird. I, I'm not really sure what's going on. I would like to get this evaluated. My, um, a family member of mine, menopausal, not on hormones, no HRT at all texted me and said, I'm having spotting, like real spotting, like red spotting, not just in the mucus, like spotting. So go get a pelvic ultrasound. So she went to her GP, got a pelvic ultrasound, had developed polyps, Mm. fully menopausal it's not common i cuz estrogen estrogen is usually a driver for polyp development yeah, um which are kind of like skin tags up in the uterus and um but she had them popped out and it was like every it was fine she didn't have to start over in her count or anything the polyps are very um they have a lot of capillaries to them and so they bleed really easily and mm. so when they get bumped moved whatever then they they bleed and so I was like oh that's the reason don't start over it's a polyp let's get the polyp removed and that's why it's always important to go to your doctor so if you have any type of bleeding after menopause absolutely go to your doctor get it checked out for all the reasons that you talked about yeah. I had uh, I had bleeding three times since I've been in menopause one of them was the vaginal dryness and the other one was actually, actually twice was vaginal dryness and the other one was when I changed my thyroid medication to yeah. your point, what you mentioned before, and I didn't know this, this was so fascinating to me. So I had changed my medication. I had went from a higher dose to a lower dose the next day bleeding. And I'm yeah. talking, I had a full on like period and I was in menopause already for over a year. And I was like that, I was like, Whoa. And I called my doctor immediately. I'm like, yeah. I went to go see my doctor, but I had never heard that changing your dosage of your thyroid medication or any medication can actually spark blood. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's not a period. It's not like, like the brain right. and the ovaries haven't like started that roller coaster has not started back up. It's more of, um, like a sensitivity, like a sensitivity in the uterus, uh, like I say, like a withdrawal bleed, so to speak, or a shift in the uterus. And I've heard that as well. When women shift their estrogen dose for their hormone replacement therapy, I have, or mm -hmm. even their progesterone, I've had women 
go up or go down or decide to go off, you know, they're, they're menopausal. They're like, I don't want to do HRT anymore for whatever reason. They go off and poof, they are like, ah, but now I'm bleeding. I'm like, it's probably because you were on some and you completely went off. So it's probably a withdrawal. Um, okay. We still have to do our due diligence and make sure, you, you know, get a pelvic ultrasound as a start. It's all good. Then we just keep an eye on it. And it's fine. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. So you, you mentioned, you alluded to HRT and bleeding. So a lot of women, again, well, I, I love this because I'm like, great, we have a doctor that we can ask all these questions to. And I'm <laughs> yes. always like tagging doctors, you know, I'm like, okay, these are out of my lane. So I love this. So women will, will say, you know, they started then not so much coming off it, but they started HRT and then they, they got a cycle. Yeah. How come that happens? Because you are, again, like that roller coaster, uh, you, when you start, uh, so when you, depending what you start, oftentimes it's estrogen, estradiol or estradiol and estriol known as biased. Um, and then, and then progesterone. And so again, that brain to ovarian connection. So you'll start HRT and then you add in some hormone. And so the uterus is like, all right, cool. I have receptors. They're getting turned on again. Let's go. And then you get some bleeding when you start HRT. So the, those receptors, if you think of a, a, a mentor of mine described it as when you're in menopause and you have very low levels of hormone, again, menopausally low, they're, they're supposed to be low at that age. Um, but think of like, like a wheat field, like all the wheat blowing in the wind. Think of those as your receptors. And they're like, where is estrogen? Where is progesterone? So they're like, you know, touch me, touch me, touch me, bind to me, bind to me. Like I need estrogen. And then you start HRT. And so now you start some hormone and all those, those waving wheats are like, woohoo, I've got estrogen attached to me. And so as a result, you can get bleeding in some women, it can happen. So if somebody's in menopause and that happens and they bleed, does it, does the clock reset? So if they're fully menopause, no, no, if they're fully menopausal, no, we still okay. have to, we still have to do our due diligence. You know, it's probably the HRT 9.5 okay. times out of 10 it's HRT. Um, but I sometimes, again, like in, when I was in clinical practice, I, I knew my people. So I knew their history. I've been working them up and all the things. So sometimes we wouldn't do a pelvic ultrasound. Sometimes I'm like, I know your history. I know what's going on. It's change in HRT. We're going to see what happens next month. And other times I'm like, I know it's probably the HRT. I'm still sending you for an ultrasound because of whatever history, endometriosis, PCOS, history of heavy periods, history of fibroids, mom's history, whatever it is. I'm like, oof, no, yeah. it's probably the HRT. We're still going to do our due diligence because when you add in extra hormone, let's say fibroids, something super benign, it's a fibroid was little, it was shrinking because you hadn't had a period. Then you go on estrogen as part of your HRT and now it grows again. And now fibroids again are also very thin skinned. They have a lot of capillaries and they can bleed. And so we get an ultrasound and I'm like, oh, looks like the HRT has actually caused your fibroid to grow back again. And that's why you're spotting. Okay. So I don't want anyone to listen to this and think, oh, well, Carrie said most of the time it's from the HRT and I'm, I'm fine. Like, no, we still have to do your due diligence. Always. I would still hate for you to have a fib. You know, fibroids are generally benign, but like they're a pain. Polyps, generally benign, but not always, you know, hyperplasia, which is called thickening. It's a fancy word for thickening. Like we don't want to develop that, you know? So there's just key things that I'm like, your insurance is probably going to cover that ultrasound. Let's just do our due diligence to make sure we know what we're up against. What's the difference between a cyst, a polyp and a fibroid? So the cyst is on the ovary. So the cyst develops because of the follicle, like a follicle doesn't rupture. So follicle, think of like a, like a plastic bag with water in it. So it's, and, and then it's supposed to supposed to pop open and you've got a little egg inside and then the water gets reabsorbed by your body and then the, that follicle eventually if you're not pregnant it, it will make hormone but then it will also get reabsorbed by the body well now if the plastic bag doesn't pop open then it goes on to form a cyst so the, it, the most common type is called a simple cyst and we can see it on ultrasound it's annoying but eventually the body generally reabsorbs it because the immune system comes in and says no no this is this isn't right let's handle this now, inside the uterus, you can get fibroids and polyps. You can actually get them in any of the layers of your uterus. So you can get them on the inside, which is called the endometrial layer. You can get them in the middle layer, which is your muscular layer. That's the squeezy layer. And you can actually get them on the outside. You can have um, a fibroid on the outside of your uterus or a polyp that kind of dangles off the outside, which really doesn't affect your cycle at all because the cycle part is on the inside. And so fibrous is, fibroids are literally fibrous tissue that have formed. Whereas polyps, think of like a skin tag as they kind of get elongated 
we call them pedunculated, which is a fun name to say. Um, but again, they have a lot of capillaries to them. They can be very hormonally driven. We don't really know what causes them, but we do know hormones can drive them to grow. Um, a lot of women with fibroids, they shrink in menopause. And so their fibroids may be small enough that their OBGYN says, you know what, instead of having the surgery to remove them, you're so close to menopause. Let's just let you get into menopause. And they generally shrink. Polyps are a little bit different. We don't tend to see those shrinks. I at least never saw them shrink in practice. If somebody had a polyp, we usually um, pretty much always chose to remove them. Can hormones also make cysts grow? Yes. Yeah. Because that the brain connection to the, to the uh, ovaries, the, mm-hmm. to the follicles there okay. um, is telling the follicle to like do its thing and growing is one of the aspects of that. And so, yeah, okay. if you can, I have not seen um, on HRT, by the time you're on HRT, you're not generally, you're, you're like follicle making age is kind of done. So even with PCOS women, I don't generally see cysts development in a, in a, in a like late stage perimenopause, menopausal PCOS woman, obviously you are at risk for cysts. That's polycystic ovary syndrome. You don't have to have a cyst, but you were more likely to develop one, um, in the younger cycling years. And anyone can develop a cyst. Cysts are not specific to PCOS. Um, anyone can develop one, but as you get close to menopause, we don't generally see all these, you know, the cyst formation anymore. In fact, in a lot of PCOS women, because of the shift in hormone, um, their PCOS symptoms oftentimes feel, feel better. They actually, like their periods may regulate again because they used to be so heavy androgenic and now everything's kind of starting to fall um, because you're heading closer to menopause. And then they, I have a lot of PCOS women in their forties that were like, man, perimenopause was actually great. My PCOS symptoms got so much better <laughs> because the hormone shift for the better to them. Yeah. I was like, yep, that can happen. And, and I don't know if you have, if you've had this or seen this, um, my PCOS women in the hit their forties and become pregnant because of that shift in hormones <laughs> as you wave your hands. 41. Yes. Yep, had they, my third because, at 41. <laughs> so they thought they, they think, you know, I don't really ovulate PCOS. It's been a real struggle for me. And then they get into perimenopause and their hormones shift. And now they become more like a non PCOS woman, not realizing, oh no, I'm going to start ovulating regularly. My hormones are more quote unquote balanced compared to my younger years. And then they go, Oh, I must be getting to menopause. I haven't had a period in four months and I'm like I'm <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny you say that because I, I, I now I always say like my life is like a jigsaw puzzle. And since doing, since really being focused on perimenopause and menopause over the last, let's say six years, I've kind of like pieced everything together. And originally I thought I started perimenopause after I gave birth to my third, which was at 41. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, at 42, nothing went back to be the same. And I'm like, oh, I must've started it then. Now I realize I actually started Perry at 36. I started mm. with phantom smells and I got pregnant in perimenopause. I actually got pregnant at 39. I lost the baby, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And then I got, well, I guess fortunately I have now my little one. So I got pregnant again at 40 and had her at 41. And now I realize I got pregnant in perimenopause and I had to, had to I used fertility. I, when, when I was trying, when I was getting pregnant, when I tried to get pregnant with my son, who's now 20 and I was like 32 at the time, but to get pregnant with my third, I needed nothing. Like I got mm-hmm. pregnant naturally, no issues at all. So interesting that you say that. And a lot of mm-hmm. women will say to me, you know, when I, I've done several videos of my story and a lot of women will say, you know, oh, I had, you know, also a baby in my late thirties or forties. And then I feel like I started perimenopause right after that. Can you talk to that a little bit more? Because I, I have so many women have asked me and yeah. I was like, okay, I got to dig into the research about it. I just haven't had a <laughs> chance yes. to do that. <laughs> yes. Well, also think about it. Like, let's say you are, let's say you're in your 40s, young, you're between 40, 40 and 45. I don't know if you can, my dog is having a dream. He's on the floor over here howling. <laughs> it's something. Um, you're 40 to 45. You've, you've had a baby. And so we all know it doesn't matter what age you are, but postpartum and whether you breastfeed or don't, like it's kind of chaotic. Your hormones are kind of chaotic, right? And if you choose to breastfeed, depending how long you choose to breastfeed, the chaoticness continues that whole time, whether it's six months, a year, two years, however long you choose to breastfeed. So you can absolutely question, did I just go into perimenopause when it's also possible you are quote unquote, normally postpartum, like you are in that hormonal sort of milieu, delivered a baby, and now you're breastfeeding. 
Where it gets a little complicated, and I don't mean that in a negative way at all, is that you are in your 40s. And so your brain and your ovaries are like, ah, we, like we're already go, sort of slowly not doing this as well as we used to in your 20s and 30s. And, so, and then now you just, now you're postpartum where it's kind of trying to put the pieces back together. And so you can very much feel perimenopause because of the age but also you are just normally postpartum in in what's going on and so you may feel perimenopause for a while and then you get not get better but like you you like you're like oh I feel pretty a lot more balanced like oh, I'm not perimenopause like uh, now I'm, I'm back to you I weaned breastfeeding or whatever it is yeah. and I'm feeling really good and so like I take it back I'm not perimenopause but because of our age you know my my patients were like Carrie, I'm 43. I'm like, you literally just had a baby four months ago. Mm-hmm. I get what you're saying, but also you were a normal four month postpartum mama. Let's mm-hmm. work with that. Yeah. So interesting. Like I, it's I find so like, interesting. And my sister had a baby at 42, which I find fascinating too. And there's certain changes with her and her babies. Now he's like three already. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's like, what is postpartum? And then what is actually entering into that phase? Right? Yes. So it's fascinating. Yes. And you, you don't really know. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no test for it. You know, there's no test for perimenopause. I, I don't have a um, marker to say at this age, you're going to go into, you know, you, we don't come with a book. We, there's no like, let me, sl- let me manual. skip that chapter, that manual and be like, oh, okay. At 48, that's when you go. Because yeah. So, so it is a little of like, we're going to take it month to month. We're going to support your foundations as best as we can. And, and in that postpartum, are you perimenopausal stage? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm happy that you mentioned testing because we're going to segue there. But at first I have to show you some props that I have that I think you're going to love. So I do a lot of TV segments and I love props. So here I've got my little ovary. <gasps> Look ovary at your prop. ovary. I even love the colors. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> the and cutest. then we've got our colon prop, which I know we're going to get into. I love it. And yep. then we've got our thyroid because I want to talk about the thyroid. Of course. And then we have our adrenals because we need to talk about our adrenals. Oh, all the I things. Like, all the I things. love props. And it makes it so fun, right? Because like it just kind of makes it so much more endearing. All right. So let's segue into testing because I love, I, I want to understand. So some people that we follow on social media will say, never, never get your hormones tested. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you're in, because we know that when we're in perimenopause, I mean, obviously our hormones are erratic and then mm-hmm. tests can come back and your doctor will say, well, you're not in perimenopause, which is, you know, from all the research that we do on our page, it's probably, it's the number one myth that I hear from women all the time is they go to their doctor, they're in their forties and fifties. They tell them, you know, what they're going through and their doctor's like, Nope, you're too young to be in perimenopause. We tested your hormones. You're fine. You're, you know, you, you can't be, can't be perimenopause, can't be menopause, can't be peri. So let's talk about the testing. So what are women supposed to do who are entering to 35 and up? Mm -hmm. They're experiencing all of these symptoms that we now know there's over 103, according to our research, like there are a lot of symptoms. What, what, what should we do? What should women do? How can they determine if they're in perimenopause or not? And does it matter for them to determine that? So, um, perimenopause is not determined by a test at all. It's determined by age and symptoms. Now we use testing to help figure out what's changing. How can we optimize it? What's going on? What's holding you back? But if somebody came to me, just as you said, and said, I'm 38, 42, 48, these are the symptoms I'm having. I'm like, I don't really care what your hormones are doing, but we are going to evaluate them based on your age. And based on these symptoms you've got out of the 103, it looks like you're perimenopausal. I mean, once you hit your forties and fifties, I'm like, you're like, you are at that transitional time in your life. Um, yeah, you're perimenopausal. What we use the testing for is just as I said. So I am 46 with regular cycles. I still, and I ovulated this month. Um, so we're recording this, what month are we in? August, my August. I absolutely, I was like, hold on. I absolutely, you know, ovulated. And so I am actually have a test and I'm going to do my test in, uh, two days, five to seven days after ovulation. So day like 1920 for me. And now some people on social media would argue, no, no, at 46, you shouldn't test at all. I'm like, except except I still have regular cycles and I do know when I ovulate. I don't ovulate every month, but this month I did. So I'm going to go ahead and see what I look like on an ovulatory month. I'm choosing to do that. I know though, my August may not look the same as September, may not look the same as October or November. It'll be probably close, but maybe not entirely the same just because, you know, female perimenopausal, but I'm going to use this data 
at large to continue to help try to optimize me. Because I'm actually testing more than just estrogens and progesterone. I would like to know what my testosterone is doing. I would like to know what other markers, DHEA. I would like to know what my cortisol is doing. I would like to know what my thyroid is doing. I would like to know some of my nutrients, B6, B12, vitamin D. You know, there's a, my insulin, my glucose. And there's a lot I like to know yeah. knowing I'm in this perimenopausal transition because all of them I can optimize, whether I do it through diet, nutrition, stress management, sleep, supplements, HRT, if we need to go there, like I know I can optimize and I hate, hate when women get told either you're too young or you're not in perimenopause or there's nothing we can do, or here's the birth control pill. No, no. Mm -hmm. I'm like, or, you know, welcome to perimenopause. Good luck. Right. Just buckle in lots of women before you've gone through it. Deal with it. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a ton of hope and a ton of help, which is why you and I are here, right? So I'm a big fan of testing, not to determine if you're in it, but to determine how I can help you optimize it. Okay. First of all, yeah, like, (laughs) like honestly, right. Hello. Right. Like that is like, and I, I'm also a really big fan of testing. I'm going to add to that vitamin D I'm going to add to that, you know, if our vitamin D levels are low, our thyroid, like you mentioned earlier, like Yes, we need to understand our ferritin. Like we need to understand what's going on with our body in this phase of life so that we can help. Because just for example, vitamin D alone, Mm -hmm. if your vitamin D is suboptimal or you're deficient, your mood is going to be affected. You're you're going to be exhausted. Your immunity, like there's so many things that are tied into these things that are going on physiologically that testing is so crucial. Okay, so. Wait, and let me just add on, it changes in perimenopause. So I will, you mentioned thyroid earlier and your thyroid medication when you were going through perimenopause, all of your glands are affected. All your glands and organs are affected. Every single one of them. So if you're thinking to yourself or your doctor says to you, I'm not going to check your thyroid because we did that a year ago or two years ago and you were fine. Guess what? Where you are now in perimenopause or maybe you're closer to menopause or maybe you've hit that 12 month mark and you're menopausal. You're a whole different woman than you were two years ago. So you absolutely have to get this regular testing because it changes with you. It's not just the ovaries that change. Everything can change because the ovaries are changing. Okay. So let's talk Dutch testing because Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of the Dutch test and I have, I do it myself. I do it at least once a year myself. And as a practitioner, I recommend it. I I don't practice, but I always recommend it to anybody who wants to get it, who wants to understand things. I'm a a big fan, but Carrie, and I know you're going to agree with me here is I can't even tell you how often I will hear on social media that people will say a Dutch test is a scam. Don't get the Mm -hmm. Dutch test. It doesn't like, can we just set it straight? Because I am so tired of hearing that because a, I know Dr. Dr. Tara Scott, who I've interviewed a few times already. She's a big fan. I know you worked for the Dutch company. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Dr. Debbie Rice. Like Mm -hmm. I'm a massive fan. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about the Dutch Dutch test, why we should be getting it and why it's so crucial. So Dutch is an acronym that stands for dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. And what I find interesting in the people who don't agree with doing a Dutch test is I don't know if it's because it's a dried urine test. I don't know if it's because it's a popular test and if it's, you know, anything popular must be bad. I don't actually know. I know some people have said there's no research behind it, which is not true. They even, they have an entire page on the research that they've been published in. They've even co-published research um, with the Aura Ring, Aura Ring back when they were figuring out back when they were figuring out um, women's cha- ovulation, temperature change, and aura, they matched it with Dutch testing to, to see that was like their Kickstarter uh, study. And so I was like, I'm like, well, that's right there, I can show you that there's an actual page for, for research. Secondly, urine testing has been around since the dawn of day. Like urine as a marker, like blood or saliva or stool, urine is one of the things we excrete and has been used for a long, long time to evaluate various things. And so the concept of using urine as a marker should not be foreign to anyone. What Dutch has done is instead of having to pee in a cup or collect your urine in a jug over 24 hours, which is the 24 hour urine test, Um, that they've taken it and you've allowed you to urinate on these little strips of paper, which you let dry, and then you fold everything up, mail it back to the lab. So it's called a dried urine test. So instead of collecting 24 hours in a jug, you just pee on strips of paper, kind of like a pregnancy test. The pregnancy test was a piece of paper, like a a strip of paper, a couple times through the day and send it back. 
And what you get out of it, what you get out of any urine test is you get things called metabolites, which are the breakdown products of hormones. It tells you where a hormone is or isn't going. You make a progesterone, where does it go? You make an estrogen, estradiol, where does it go? These metabolites now have an entire field of research called metabolomics. It's the study of the smaller portions, the breakdown portions of these hormones, because we now realize how important they are and how active they can be positively or negatively. And so by doing the Dutch test, I will get information on your estrogen, estrone, estradiol, estriol, progesterone, testosterone, DHEAS, and I will get to see where it's going. So estrogen detoxification, I get a picture into some of it. Your progesterone breakdown, some of it is helpful to know for sleep, anxiety, and calmness. Testosterone and DHEA breakdown, some of that breakdown is helpful to know is PCOS, cystic acne on the jaw, hair growth in places you don't want, male and, pale and female pattern hair loss on the head. These metabolites can tell me this information. The other cool thing we get out of the Dutch test are called organic acids. So organic acids are similarly like a breakdown or a shift. You're, you've, you've, got a, you've got a molecule trying to go A to B. And if A to B is blocked, it will turn around and go a different direction and end up in the urine. So the more you have, that just tells me, oh, you can't get to B. So you've turned around and come out in the urine instead. So we get this information on markers like B6, B12, glutathione, um, melatonin. You know, we get really cool information. And again, the Dutch test is not going to tell me if you are in perimenopause, that is age and symptoms, but it will tell me how you doing. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you feeling like that? Why do you have those symptoms? And how can we use this information coupled with blood work for your thyroid, your vitamin D, your blood sugars, insulin, et cetera, to do better, feel better and thrive. And I also love that it talks about, it shows you methylation because for yes. me, that was a big one. So I knew genetically, because I had my genetic test done and I knew that I don't methylate properly, but when I actually saw you know, whether or not, because I know sometimes you could genetically, you could be a certain way. And then what it actually happens in real life, is it something different? But my methylation. And I've done it so many times that I take supplements to try to get that methylation, you know, into the right range. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important one. And also the breakdown of the estrogens, especially, you know, again, I, I don't focus on hormones or HRT because again, it's not my lane, mm -hmm. but what I do try to tell women is that also, if you're going to go on HRT, wouldn't it be a good thing to know what your estrogen metabolites are? Like if it goes yeah. to the two or the four or the 16? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And again, it's the Dutch test is not the complete all of your de detoxification pathways. I mean, that's just massive. It is, it's yeah. kind of like the most, most common, most popular um, the, the, that we can, that is being out, studied out there in the literature. And a hundred percent, if you are on estrogen, I, in fact, I just got a, I got a DM yesterday from a, a practitioner um, who said, mom died of um, breast cancer, BRCA gene positive, um, Breast cancer runs in her siblings already. She doesn't have breast cancer, but she's gonna. She's doing her second Dutch test and wanted to know if I could help her with this. And I'm like, you were the perfect candidate. You were the perfect candidate to see, because this is what mm -hmm. we can see. She's got her genetics yeah. and of the testing we have available to us, this is a great option for you to see where is your estrogen going and how can we optimize it? And even if somebody's listening to this going, well, I don't have any breast cancer in my family. It's still a worthwhile test to do because if you're on estrogen, I don't want you to be the first. If we can do dietary changes, supplemental changes, stress changes, lifestyle habit changes to alter these pathways yeah. to your benefit and reduce your risk even a little bit, it's not a guarantee, but it like even some, I'm all for it. And that's why I like having this information, especially as we had in a perimenopause and menopause. So if mm -hmm. I can adjust you now in your 30s or 40s, when, you know, worst case scenario stuff could happen, let's do it. Let's you do it. You mentioned detoxification. Let's talk about that for a minute and why it's mm -hmm. so important in perimenopause and menopause. One of the really, um, and I hear this on social media a lot, is that pe people, experts will say that we, there's nothing, we don't need to do anything with our liver. So when we detoxify out of the body, we detoxify out of various places and organs. So like you sweat, your breath, right? Your, your liver filters out stuff. The way you pee or poop it out, like we get rid of and eliminate a lot of ways in our body. The liver is talked a lot about in the land of hormones. And you will hear on social media, there is absolutely nothing you need to do. To, you don't need to do detoxification. You don't need to support it because you were born with a perfect liver and its job is to filter out and clean and clear out 
the junk, the crap, break all this down for you. And while in theory, that is 100% true, hopefully you were born with a perfect liver and hopefully it's doing its job just fine. Unfortunately, in the real life. Unfortunately, <laughs> reality is one, it takes a boatload of nutrients to make your liver work. B vitamins, choline, zinc, selenium, magnesium, you know, like I, the list goes on and on. If you're not eating those things, if you're not absorbing those things, then you're not going to have a perfect liver. It's going to struggle just because of the nutrient information. Secondly, we live in the real world, which unfortunately has a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals out there. Where do they go? They go in the liver. We have to filter them somehow. Lifestyle choices, alcohol, vaping, smoking, right? Like things, all of that goes right to the liver. Medications. I'm not saying do or don't do medications, but they all go to the liver and have to get broken down and processed. And your hormones do too. Everything goes to the liver. So if you have a backup on the freeway in your town, think of that as your liver. If you've got alcohol trying to get in there and you've got your medication trying to get in there and you've got all the chemicals, toxic chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals around you trying to get in there. And then poor little estrogen is like me, me, I'm trying to get in too. It's Help. gonna. It's not the priority. It's gonna have to take a back seat. And oh, mm -hmm. by the way, if you absolutely actually also happen to be deficient in zinc, deficient in magnesium, deficient in B12, deficient in folate, or have genetic SNPs that you don't process these things very well, then it's going to affect the way that you mm -hmm. your liver functions. On top of that, on top of that. The NIH, the National Institute for Health, says 24% of adults in America have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. One in four, 24% of people, adults, have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If you are one in that one in four, your liver, your fatty liver, is not processing things well. So you better believe it's not going to process your hormones well either. So while I understand when people on social media say, don't, you don't need to focus on your liver. You don't need to take any kind of detox support. You don't need to like none of that. We should, we hopefully you were born with a perfect liver, but the reality is life happens. Now I don't agree with like people who were trying to upsell you crap products to quote unquote clean your liver. But if you understand the physiology of your liver and you understand, you know, what you talk about with like all the, the foundational work to clean up your life, clean up your health, that's only going to help your liver. Um, that's what I'm trying to focus on those basics. And also like optimal word crappy, you know, like, and that's the yeah. thing. There are so many products out there that you're like, and women are like, you know, what do I do? What do I use? And that's literally why we started Morphous was because I was so done with all the products that everyone's telling everyone to take mm -hmm. that affect us in this phase of life. And that's why for me, you know, our, our, my, our, what we do is so important to me that it's all based on research and a lot of N of one, I have to tell you yeah. a lot of N of one testing and a lot of, you know, N of community testing, yeah. like, and, yeah. you know, everyone around me. So for me, that's a big one. And, and then I think that's really important because the number of women where, they say, this thing happens to me, or this is what I'm experiencing. And they get told that's not possible. Oh, that's not possible. That, it doesn't happen like that. I'm like, are you kidding? I mean, even um, I put a post up a long time ago. I ginger, the, the herb ginger. Ginger, we use a lot in for nausea, right? We use it for motion yeah. sickness. We use yeah. it for pregnancy nausea. We use it for, right, times. all this stuff for ginger, right? Ginger makes me nauseous. Mm -hmm. I have the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. So I'm the weirdo outstander when it comes to ginger. If I were to tell a doctor that, you know, like, oh, take ginger for your nausea. It makes me nauseous. They'd be like, that's not possible. It cures, it treats nausea. Look, I don't care. I'm an N of one, but that's what it does to me. And I had so many women in the comments who were like, oh, I have this like, quote unquote, weirdo thing too, you know? Yeah. And I get told I'm different as a result. I'm like, nope, it is what it is. So we have to take these N of one sometimes because it's our body and that's what we live in. That's it. And being gaslit and being told that it can't happen just because it's not in the medical literature. That's one of my biggest pet peeves because, you know, we can't test everything. Not everything can be in the medical literature. And, and what I'm learning too, is that things that are being tested are very specific, right? And mm -hmm. we, some, you know, the way we live our life isn't always so specific. So mm -hmm. I think that listening to that, and when I always say, listen to your bodies, ladies, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Don't take it. Don't eat it. Even if it's kale and everyone's like, eat kale. It's so good for you, but kale doesn't work for you don't eat kale. Like it's just, everybody is their own unique individual person. And one of the things I say a lot to Carrie is that what worked for us before perimenopause and menopause 
may not work for us once we're in menopause yeah. and perimenopause. Like things change, ch things shift, like whether that's exercise, whether that's being able to have a glass of wine before bed and now you can't because it's going to, you know, metabolize and wake you up throughout the night or whether it's that, you know, the junk food that you loved eating or whether it's even mindset. Like there's yeah. so many things that change. And I look at this phase of life as being such a beautiful time. And I know for, for a lot of you who are listening, you're like, but I can't even get out of bed, Andrea. And I get it. I was there. Like, I think I had like, I always say, I joke, I had like most of the symptoms that are at, like, literally I've had so many different symptoms, which is why I could share so much of my story. I'm like, yep, had that, had that. But at the same time, it's that when we, you know, when we start feeling better and we go into menopause for many of us, the symptoms do get better. To your point, a lot of us still have a lot of the symptoms. And according to our research, certain symptoms are more mm -hmm. common in menopause than they are in perimenopause. And, you know, but it is a time where we could start, you know, kind of, we, we start to become more confident. We start to really understand ourselves a lot better. Like there, there is such a beautiful time in this phase of life too, I find that, yeah. you know, yeah. I a hundred percent, I couldn't agree more, which is why I love talking about the topic and it can seem all doom and gloom. Um, but I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just trying to educate and empower because there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of help. And yeah, when you, as you go through it and become the new you, you know, it's a reverse puberty. Imagine, remember when you went through puberty and became the new you yeah. now, you know, you're now your caterpillar and a butterfly again. And so when you come out the other end, you're back to a butterfly again, and it's going to be amazing, but it is, I can see, you know, like it can be a little hard or real hard or real frustrating when you're in the thick of it and you don't know anything yeah. about it. If nobody's taught you in your family you watched your family go through it really rough. Your doctor is gaslighting you and telling you that's not possible. I get it. But that's why there's you and this podcast and educators out there who are trying to show you the light and that it's going to be, it, to cross fingers, it's going to be okay. Hmm. And when we know, like to quote Dr. Maya Angelou, when we know better, we do better. And we have to understand what's even happening to us for even to us to understand how to do better. So I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Is there anything that we didn't talk about when it comes to hormones that you feel is really important for our listeners to walk away with? Because I know we didn't really touch upon HRT. I know you alluded to it here and there. I don't know if that's something that you do want to talk about or do you talk about? I'm totally happy to have you go. There <laughs> I if love you HRT. To. I feel like that's definitely its own um, podcast episode because there's so much controversy and so much politics and so much. Um, yeah scarce you know everyone's afraid of hrt do i do want to put this out there when somebody says hrt most of the time what they're talking about when they're scared is estrogen are the estrogens estrone estradiol estriol hormone replacement therapy though is a broad topic progesterone testosterone thyroid insulin right these are all hormone replacements that we can use for whatever you need in your body but when it comes to hrt a real disservice has been done unfortunately and estrogen is not the root of all evil uh, as it has been made out to be. Now, estrogen can be causing a lot of your symptoms, but it's not so much estrogen that's the issue. It's like, why Why is estrogen causing? Is it detoxification issues? Is it genetic SNPs? Is it lifestyle habits? Is it, you know, all the above added on? And, and that's why, is it chemicals? Like this is the toxic chemicals. This is why estrogen has become a problem. But the um, the WHI trial is what set off hormones are bad. All hormones are bad. And all of them are going to lead to cancer. And since that time, in fact, I have a study pulled up of the WHI trial revisited. And through the years, a lot of the articles written by various authors, original authors who were kind of like, oops, that wasn't true. Oops, that's not actually the case. Oops. Actually, you know, estrogen can really be helpful in these key areas um, have started to come out, but unfortunately they have not gotten the publicity that the original WHI article, um, had. And so again, HRT is an entirely big, uh, separate podcast. And, um, I, I totally believe HRT is not for everyone. I love HRT. And if it is a fit for you, great. But if it's not due to cardiovascular markers or genetics or family risk, that's okay. Like, it's okay. You don't have, you don't like, we can work with that. But I do want everyone listening to know that obviously breast cancer is the big thing we think about with, with estrogen hormone replacement therapy, but cancer is complicated. All cancer is complicated. There is not one single handed thing that's the cause of cancer. And I hear that where women go, no, I started HRT and got breast cancer. It was hundred percent my HRT. I'm like, well, actually there was probably a whole milieu in your environment and your breast tissue 
that made, you know, and then you added HRT on top of it and it was the straw that broke the camel's back, right? right. It's not it, like estrogen single-handedly right. is not the cause of cancer. It's very multifaceted. Um, and I, that's a hard one for people to wrap their head around because they're like, no, estrogen causes cancer. I'm like, well, I accept you didn't have it in your teens, 20s, 30s. I interviewed Dr. Joanne Manson, who is one of the original authors on mm -hmm. in, at the WHI study on it. And uh, I'm going to link to it below. And it was really interesting to hear what she had to say. So kind of like how you were just alluding to some of the authors that were on it. So it's yeah. um it's a it's a big topic. And I love that you're also saying that it's not just estrogen and progesterone you're talking about. There's so many other things that come into play, which I, we many of us don't associate it with yeah. HRT, right? We don't make that thing. So I would love to have the conversation. Like, I, I think it's an important It's a good one. one to have. So Carrie, how can people find you? Like, do you work one-on-one -on -one with clients or is there a way that people can find you? I mean, on social media, but also how can they find you if they want to learn more about what you do? Social media is a good one. Um, I hang out a lot on Instagram. I'm at dr.carriejones. I have like dipping my toe into TikTok. I'm going to need all your help with that. So I'm at Dr. Carrie Jones over there on TikTok website, www.drcarriejones.com. I do not see patients, but I do work uh, quite a bit with a coaching dietitian group called Nutrition Dynamic. And um, they do the Dutch test. They do a lot of hormonal work. Um, they work with a nurse practitioner as well. And so that is also an option for people uh, looking for um, somebody to help them guide them through this. Thank you. Is there anything you'd love to leave anyone, our audience with before we go? Any other well, thoughts? Yeah, the, my, my favorite, in fact, I have it on my reader board on that side behind me is um, just remember as you're going through this, you know, not to forget your joy. Um, not to forget your community, your play, because you are going through a big transition and you can feel like you're all alone when in fact you're not. And it can be a little maybe challenging for your family or your significant other who doesn't understand it either. Um, and so just, you know, to remember that um, you, everything is changing. You were turning into a new butterfly and keep finding your joy and you, there's a lot of hope and help. So you're going to be okay. I love that. I actually, it reminds me of a quote here. So we have like our little monk here and a quote that I have is women in menopause are like butterflies. First, they undergo metamorphosis. Then they take flight to become their true, authentic and free selves. And I love that. So that's thank the you, truth. Kyrie. There it. you go. Thank you. I really appreciate you being on. I just adore you. And uh, thank you for doing this today. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Carrie Jones as much as I did. And I hope you learned a lot about hormones as we go into perimenopause and menopause. I know I did. If you enjoyed it, please share it because the more you share shows you care. Please leave us a review and please go listen to other podcasts that we have done as I have interviewed so many incredible experts in the field of perimenopause and menopause that I know you could learn a lot from. Thanks for listening. Thanks for spending the last hour or so with us. I appreciate you. And as always, I'll see you at the next podcast. Thank you.